Fisherman's Post, <laughs> more fish, more often. Hello and welcome to another podcast episode. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post coming at you since 2003. Newspaper, website, tournaments, fishing schools, and now the growing in popularity saltwater podcast series. Um, this is the podcast series where we talk to local captains, local guides, and try to share with you their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often up and down the North Carolina coast. This episode is titled Early Season Cobia Fishing Out of Oregon Inlet. Um, my guest today is Captain Donnie Davis out of the Nags Head area. Cobia, very popular species. Looking forward to talking Cobia with, with longtime friend Donnie Davis. Um, before we get to Donnie, I introduce you to my co-host, Billy Thorpe. Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Welcome, Billy. What's up, Gary? Good to see you again. There was maybe a little joke of an overweight co-host, a uh, little <laughs> joke I overheard, so whatever. Yeah, I think whatever. it was your, I'm Conan, you're my Andy. <laughs> All right, whatever. What, I'm not, I don't stay up that late, so I don't know what that show is. Yeah, we could talk Johnny Carson. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know who that is either, so. Oh, man. Well, dude, how's it been? Everything going good? We got some nice weather out there today, nice and rainy. Nice and perfect. rainy. Everything's going great. I mean, perfect for the boat. Excited, you know, loving this creative project, loving doing this, and was very much looking forward to filming another episode today. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, no more of those verbal abuses toward me, and I'll show up next week. Right on. All right. Well, before uh, I start talking too much, I'm going to tell you how you can watch and listen to the show. Uh, a lot of people have asking, where can I find the podcast? And we are everywhere, YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, IGTV, so Instagram, if you watch on IGTV, and then any podcast platform, so we're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, uh, Google Podcasts, all the above. If you can't find it on your favorite way to listen to a podcast, let us know, and we'll be sure to submit our feed onto there. Uh, so go check it out, and be sure to subscribe. When you do that, you'll get a little notification that says, hey, Fisherman's Post put out a new episode, check it out. So, Gary, that's a way. I'm still trying to teach Gary how to do that, you know. He's uh, bringing him into the 21st century. So here's how you use a phone. All right. An iPhone. Uh, an iPhone. Perfect. Uh, as you guys can see down here in the bottom, if I can figure out where to point to it on my screen, we have a new sponsor, Marine Warehouse Center. Uh, so we're really excited to bring those guys on. They love the show. Reach out to us. And so I want to play a, a little commercial spot here that they created really nice. So here we go. Marine Warehouse, we have boat, motor, and trailer sales. We have parts and accessories in our store, and we have a complete service department that will work on anything you have. At Marine Warehouse Center, we offer a large selection of boating supplies, trailer parts, and a large inventory of new trailers. What I love about Wilmington is being out in the water, being in a boat. It's my job, but also my passion. The best thing about working at Marine Warehouse Center is being able to help people get out and enjoy being on the water. Man, nice commercial. That it was is really a, good, man. It was good. That's a good commercial. That's awesome. We Why love not? those guys. I mean, they work with us in the events, the newspaper. I've come to know Emmett pretty well over the years. Oh, yeah? You want to know a little-known fact about Emmett? I would love to. I don't think many people know this. I would love to. Emmett once played golf with Michael Jordan and won $1,000. <laughs> is that true? No. <laughs> are you, no, I completely are, made it up. Well, you, you got one laugh already, so that's good. That's hey, a good sign. We need some canned laughter. I need a room full of laughter. Oh, I'm sure I can find something on here. Um, yeah, Emma and a good friend. Hey, what about uh, what about our photo feature? Yeah, let me go ahead and pull that up right here. Here's our photo feature of the week. It is uh, Bob. I'm not going to try his last name. I'll mask it. Greensville with the uh, Greensboro rather with a slot size red drum. He caught and released in the marsh near the Cape Fear River. Nice looking fish. Uh, so anyway, if you want to submit your photos to us for a chance to be featured on our Instagram account and or this podcast, go to uh, go to Instagram at fisherman's dot post and submit those pictures to us. We love getting pictures, so we can we can take them and repost them and all that fun stuff love photos once we, again something gary doesn't know how to do but i'm teaching him man i made a living <laughs> off of photos like I'm, <laughs> i know i'm talking to the wrong guy who's handled more fish photos than me hey. i'd like to shake that person's hand who's got more fish photos <laughs> <laughs> billy i'm gonna go to my guest get it man i have and i mean it longtime friend donnie davis from back in the 
from the days of ECU. I don't even know if we said the word fish out loud during our college days back then, but here we are. He has now been guiding out of Nags Head for 22 years. It's Captain Donnie Davis of DOA Guide Service here to talk about early season Cobia fishing, more specifically out of Oregon Inlet. Donnie, welcome to the show. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate you having me on, man. Stoked. Yeah, man, I am too. And I mean, Cobia are extremely popular, perhaps maybe even too popular. So I know the interest is there. I personally have had, I don't know how many Cobia trips with you myself. So this is just very comfortable to talk to you. However, before we get to the business of talking about Cobia, we have a small feature here on the Saltwater Podcast series. We like to ask our captains a couple of questions that are non-fishing related, non-fishing related questions just to help get to know you better. And so when I was thinking about this two-question feature for my good friend, Donnie Davis, who won't admit it, but he's something of an intellectual. I mean, I believe there's even books in the background as I'm talking to him, and he's got those smart-looking glasses on. I figured I would make it a literature-based question, two literature-based questions. Donnie Davis, are you ready? Uh, yeah, I'm ready, Gary. Go ahead. Fire okay. away. So here, I want you to help me out. Can you identify this famous quote from literature? I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. That's Twain. Oh, no. Here, let me finish the quote. <laughs> that was a good guess. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. Yeah, still Twain. Yeah, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> <laughs> but that was close. Of course, is, that all, is that all you got? No, I got one more quote. And you're going to like this because it's a love quote. I'm making, the, making my alma, alma mater proud there with my literary degree, my okay. literature degree. So here, here's a love quote you can use later on your wife. If you live to be 100, I want to live to be 100 minus one day, so I never have to live without you. Pooh! I'm, that's what I'm asking you. Oh, yeah, Pooh, you got it. Never mind. <laughs> yes, we have a winner. <laughs> I got it on the board over here. It's on the, it's on the children's I, art board I, already. I love it. Yes, Winnie the Pooh. Donnie Davis, you did not disappoint. You intellectual, you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little, a little hand clap there, Donnie there. Donnie, save me. Let's start talking Cobia. And where, where do we start the conversation on Cobia? Uh, where, they, where they live. I like it. We got to find them before we can catch them. Go ahead and start us off. Where, where are we finding those Cobia? Uh, we, we fish in the ocean here, Gary. A lot of places south of us... Um, <laughs> Hatteras, right on down, as far as I know, it's the Broad River in South Carolina. We'll fish for them in the rivers, um, tidal, tidal rivers. Here, it's strictly ocean-based. I've never caught one bigger than 18 inches west of the Oregon Inlet Bridge. Everything I've, every time I ever spot them, target them, they're in the ocean here. And so you're mostly out of Oregon Inlet, and when you're saying the ocean, and I've always wondered this, like, you know, do we – are we heading out? Are we cruising the, sh the shoreline? Are we heading off offshore? Like, how do you come up with a plan? Nine times out of 10, I'm within sight of land. Um, water's generally warmer up close to land when we're fishing for them because of thermal heating. So let's say the water's 60 some degrees in the morning. It generally warm up three or four degrees by the afternoon and looking for them in that shallow water, 15, 30 deep is maybe 50 feet. Just like any other type of fishing, though, it could all change. It could be sometimes out there a mile or two off the beach, three miles. But generally, I'm within sight of land, right up on the beach. And do you know when you're headed out whether or not you're going to be starting closer to shore or starting a little bit further off? Like, is there any kind of metric, any kind of formula that helps you come up with original plan? I know you play the conditions, but how do you figure out how to start? Look at Rutgers in the morning. Hopefully it's sunny. What I'm referring to is that Rutger EDU website that has temperature, that shows you um, their temperature charts. I think, I don't know when they, how much they updated, every four, every six hours. If you have a, a sunny day, you'll get a shot, you'll look at it and try to find a temperature break like most other type of fishing, or I should say open water type of fishing. It's all about the temperature. And that temperature break is how significant? Um, that's a good question, Gary, because... Over the, over the years, we've seen it change. We used to have a paradigm where we look for 68 to 72. The last few years, we've been catching in 63, 64-degree water. The only constant is we're 
looking for some type of break. Something on a te- on a temperature chart will will have. Let's use an example of 65, 66. One spot, somewhere close will be 67, 68. The harder the break, the better. You want to concentrate there. But if I can find any type of temperature break on a satellite shot, that's where I'm going to start. And that temperature break is. I'm sorry to to ask this again is typically like a degree. Like I get that the bigger the break is the better, but you're looking for a minimal of just, yeah, minimum of a degree or two is what I'm looking for, but I'm looking for a type of temperature break. But like I said, just like all fishing, there's no, there's no, nothing certain. You're, you're going where you have an idea, you have a plan. If I'm cruising along, I'm going down, let's say I want to run down the beach 15 miles because I saw on the satellite shot, I felt like there was a temperature break there. Eight miles down the beach, if I start seeing a few fish, I'm going to pull her back, and we're going to start searching there. Okay, I follow that. I mean, I follow that completely. So when are these fish, I mean, you know, every year is different. So when do you expect to see these fish show up off your coast, off of, out of Oregon Inlet? Um, last year was this day, April 30th, is when the first guys had a real catch. I mean, there was a couple of fish caught before then. But on April 30th last year, a few friends ran down the beach and they had a pretty good day on them. And first week of May was on. I mean, when I say on, we're going out there getting 20, 25 shots a day type of thing. It's what's what I'm looking for this time of year, early season. I want to get shots. It's um, it's not shaped. And let me know if I lose you here because I'm going to talk a little bit technical, Gary. I know sometimes you get confused easily. Is it's not on the bell shaped, not on the bell shaped curve like this. It's generally we're peaking, we're going straight up, and then we're tailing off like that and early on when they first show up man they show up in mass and then you're going to get 20 25 shots a day sometimes a lot more so explain to me about the habits of these cobia like why is it that you're seeing them off your coast at that time why in mass like where are they coming from where are they headed what is the purpose of them moving by the coast at that time all right um everything i'm going to talk about is speculation there's there's still very little hard science dealing from recreational standpoint on these fish because traditionally they have not been a commercial species or sought after commercial species. There's been some science done on them now because they started farm raising them in the recent past. So everything I'm saying is speculation. It's not based on the scientific or primary literature that's out there. When I first got in this business, I told people that were interested in booking these trips, we're shooting for Memorial Day weekend. That puts you in the ball game. It was anywhere from 27th, 28th of May to the first week of June. And going back when I was in college doing this in graduate school, my data indicates June 6th for three years in a row when the first fish showed up. Last year was April 30th, May May 3rd, May 4th. I mean, it was wide open, as good as it gets. So the, over time, the fish is starting to show up earlier here than they had in the past. Now, why that is, I have no idea. The baits here other things I look for, like the rays, I look for the the rays, black tip sharks, other things like that. Things that they have a tendency, in my estimation, to hang around. And we've seen those species start to show up earlier and earlier here over the last over the last two decades. Okay. And they're and again, like where where are they heading from? Where are they heading to? Because these are a cruising fish. They're not hanging out. They're on the move. Correct? Yeah. Once again, in our estimation, yeah, in my estimation, um, the paradigm is they're cruising through here and heading up to the Chesapeake Bay. And if you talk to the guides up there, I know you've done some fishing up there. It's, they'll catch them all summer long up there. And they'll come in and they'll have a big big push that comes in the bay, kind of tail off like we do, then a big push coming out of the bay in um, August, early September. But So we're going on the, on the assumption that they're cruising through, migrating through, and going up to spawn out in the bay, Chesapeake Bay. So I think for you, it's primarily sight casting that we're talking about. You are looking for opportunity. You're looking for shots. So are you seeing all these fish traveling from south to north? Are they always headed the same direction? Majority of the time, they are heading south to north. We'll talk about it on the radio or on the phone while we're fishing that, hey, we saw there's a body of fish that are moving from north to south today. Now, whether or not they're in a big oceanic gyre just doing a big circle following bait around or if their current switched and they decided to swim with the current or into the current. I don't know. But majority of the time you can assume that they're moving from South to North. And that's why we go out the inlet and make a right hand turn and head South trying to overtake them or run into them. 
And, and so if the person watching this podcast is thinking, all right, this is my year. I want to get in on this Kobe action. Basically when we first hear that there's fish being caught, it's showtime. It's time to get out there because it happens quickly. It isn't a bell curve. Things are going to happen very quickly once they start to happen. Correct. Okay. I follow. So what are we going to do, man? I'm on your boat. You know, we know there's some fish around. We head out Oregon Inlet. We take a right. You've checked the chart. You know, what's your thought process? What, what gives us our best chance? What I try to do before I even leave the dock is I go through a tutorial with everybody on the boat, especially if they've never been with me before. I feel like this is the best thing I have to offer people is getting to cast at, the, at a fish that can be up to 100 pounds. Um, a lot of days it's I mean, it's, you're going to get a shot at a 56, 60 pounder every day. And I want you to make that shot. I don't want to make that shot. I can sit up in that tower all day long and cast at these fish for you. That's what you're paying for. I want you to make that shot, hook that fish. And if you want to gaff that fish, I'm gonna let you gaff that fish. It's your game. Um, so I'm gonna go through a tutorial with you at the beginning. I'm gonna say, let's, let's imagine I'm in the tower. I'm going to call it out on the clock, the bow being 12 o'clock fish. Let's use an example. The fish is swimming from 12 to two. I want Sorry about that. Hit my hit my headphones. I want you to make that cast. See that first. I want you to see that fish. Then I want you to cast past and in front of that fish and bring it right back to his nose and jig it hard a couple times right in front of that fish. I want that fish to react. And I want you when he gets it. I want to tell you. All right, he ate it. I want you to set that hook. I'm gonna put that boat in gear. Well, we're gonna go through this whole thing. What I just said before we even leave the dock. So when we get out there, there's no question. I say, all right, there's a pair. Twelve o'clock. Moving to eleven. I want you to be ready and cast. Um, I want to definitely go into more detail on the cast. I mean, I'm not exactly sure the order of information that you envisioned us covering. And I mean, if that's coming up later, then that's coming up later. But like, I know just from myself, like I've had that question, perhaps more than any other question when sight casting for Cobia is, what's my goal with that cast? And you just mentioned it, but I think I was still laughing that you used the expletive after pulling your mic out instead of just pulling your mic out. So what would be the cast? Am I casting a little bit past the fish, a little in front of the fish? And what would be a little bit past? What would be a little in front? And what exactly is the action? I mean, anything you can do to help me out here, I know would help the viewers out here. Yeah, sure. Um, Everybody does it a little differently. I choose to feel like these. I feel like these fish are reacting to the reacting to a a two ounce thing with feathers on it going through the water. Doesn't look like anything they're eating. I don't think. Okay. So I'm trying to get a reaction strike out of them. Let's say, for example, your fish is swimming from right to left. So I'm gonna call out your fish, Gary, at 12 o'clock. So your fish is moving from 12 to 10. I want you to get your eye on that fish, and you can do it. It's not hard. It takes. It takes a, f- a few times, and you'll say, all right, yeah, I know what they look like now. I know, th- I know what I'm looking for. Anyway, I want you to throw past that fish's head, probably 10, 10 yards past that fish if you can, so you're not going to spook him. I don't, never want you to land the bucktail right on top of his head. You do that, it's game over. The fish is going down. Okay. We, just move up. we just move on. But I want you to throw past that fish and bring it on the surface or close to the surface right back to him. When I say that, I mean I want you to burn it. And I, that's what I say to people. I say burn that, burn that jig right back to his head. So throw it past him and bring it right back. You can, and you can do that by moving your rod tip. While you're reeling fast, move your rod tip from right to left. You can actually get that bucktail to move on the surface. And right when you get to his head, I want you to stop and pop, pop, pop. If he doesn't react, let it drop down. Then reel it back up real quick to the surface and pop, pop, pop. Generally, this time of year, you're, you can evoke the, a reaction strike out of him. And when you do, since they don't have teeth, they feed by crushing they have really strong crusher plates in their mouth. I want you to, uh, you got to slam it in there. And we're going to go through, and I make sure all my sh- hooks are sharp before we leave the dock. So I'm not trying to imitate anything that they would normally prey on. I'm just trying to get their attention, get them fired up. And it's not even a hunger feed. It's just a reaction bite. That, that's what I go on. Somebody might tell you something different, but that's the way I, that's the way I fish for them. I've seen guys fish really lazily for them. I feel like the way I do it works for me, and it's it's worked for a long time like that. And so the pop, pop, fall, and then bring it back up and try to get another pop, pop. And so even though we're using, what, a two-ounce bucktail, we can still get it back up to the surface using those techniques, 
because you like the action up near the surface. Exactly. That's why I fish two ounce and not three ounce or four ounce. I want it, I want it to be to sink slower and be able to keep it up higher easily. And how worried are you about getting the boat in position? Like how worried are you about the boat spooking this fish or, you know, having to get the boat in the right position for the angler to have success? That's my job. I'm always going to have that boat in position if I can help it. The only hardest thing to do on these fish or the hardest way to approach these fish is if these fish are coming at 12 o'clock and swimming right at you. If that's the case, I'll have you sometimes make a blind cast off the stern of the boat. I'll tell you, all right, he's coming. He's going to go right underneath the bow, throw it behind us. And we'll, we'll take a chance. And sometimes we'll hook a fish doing that, but it's a blind cast. It's blind cast and letting it sink down and reeling it back up and the fish will pop back up sometimes right behind the motor. But that's the hardest thing to do. Other than that, I feel like I've do, I can do you a pretty good job of getting the boat in position. If we can approach it from 10 o'clock or let's say nine o'clock to 12 o'clock on either side, nine to 12, three to 12, I can, you got a good shot at getting that fish. And so, I mean, I, what I met, I hope that everyone who watches this podcast calls you up and wants to book you for a trip. But I know that some people watching this podcast are want to use this knowledge to try it themselves. And so you're trying not to come at the fish at a 12 o'clock direction, but of course, whatever. I mean, sometimes the fish comes up quick, no matter how close you're peeling the water line, you know, for something brown in the water. Um, does that person with the boat need to worry about, you know, if I see a fish from afar, just how close I approach the fish? Like, what's your... I know you'll always have the boat in the right position, but for the guy who hopes to watch this podcast and maybe do it himself, what does he need to think about? Don't change RPMs. Okay. If you're coming up on a fish, don't gun it. Don't back it off. If you can help it, pull, get, you see a fish swimming out there, just approach it. Take your time. Don't gun it up to them. I found RPMs, changing RPMs near the fish, and it's probably just like any other fish. You know, you affect their lateral line. They spook because it's something different just go up to them. I, I fish really short rods. I like to get closer to the fish than some guys. Some guys can hit them from 50 yards away with a long eight foot rod. I use a six and a half foot rod. I want to get right up on top of the fish if I can. It's just the way I like to hook a fish and the way I like to fight a fish. I lose a lot less fish with less line out than I do when I have a whole lot of line out. But I'll put the boat right up close to the fish, let's say 30 feet away from the fish, and get you an easy cast. And I'll, as soon as you hook them, I've got the boat in position. I jam it in gear and we go and so if you see your fish from afar and then there's not a there's not a fleet of boats out there and you've got your time on this fish and you can do anything you want are you approaching it from behind are you approaching it from the side like a little bit head to but not of course completely head to it i mean if you had the ideal conditions you would create what i would try to get the boat the fish off my beam one of the two beams okay have you hook them have you hook them either at three o'clock or at nine o'clock if I can, because then when we hook them, I'm putting the boat in gear immediately. I'm putting the, at the I'm putting that boat right back in forward, and I'm setting the help and set that hook with the um with the boat. And then I'm I know you fished with me before, and I've gone through this with you before. But I like to fight my cobia. It's just like you would fight a tuna offshore. I never take the boat out of gear if I can help it. I keep it on one of those stern quarters. And so why is that? I mean, you've already told us. You know, put it in the gear to help set the hook. Why is it that you like to keep it at least idle in gear the whole time we're fighting the fish? Because the fish is not going to, one, if you fight a fish dead boat, if the fish goes under the boat, good chance you're going to lose them. Another thing is, if you keep it in gear, bump it in and out of gear, keep them off that stern quarter, majority of the time that fish will plane up to the surface while you're fighting it. And just like a tuna, man, you get them right beside the boat, stick them. Um, tell me a little bit about, what you like to throw, man. I mean, I guess we could start with a, you know, you said a two ounce bucktail. Anything in particular the, my people should look for? Um, some guys have their favorite stuff. Some guys like to fish a crab looking pattern, meaning a brown and orange, maybe some silver and white in it. Some guys fish nothing but um, chartreuse. Some guys fish reds. I used to fish for a guy back in the mid 90s, man. All we were allowed to use was white white bucktails with white tails that's all we're allowed to use white on white man i can't say it ever matters you know I, sometimes yeah that sometimes they'll snub one color to, during the day and you throw another color right behind it and they'll bite it whether or not they're looking for something i don't know um i mean a specific color i i just generally don't think that's the case and my, my friend Bob of Meat Hawk Fishing gives me lures, man. I just tell him, I don't, I don't care what you give me, man. I appreciate it. You know, it doesn't matter to me what I use. 
Um, I look at them, and you know they're a bottom fi- they're a bottom feeding fish that for some reason comes up on top and eats. I mean, they eat on the bottom. If you cut them open, with you, they're full of crabs generally. That's their number one species they prey on is crabs. But we're catching them cruising up top, like you know, eating bunker squids, menhaden. What I mean, bluefish. It doesn't matter. It seems when they're migrating through here, they do not have a preference. It appears to me. And leader matter. Some guys like some guys like to use um, fluorocarbon. I use nothing but sixty pound moi moi high seas because it's soft leader. I can tie it into a bimini really easy, and it doesn't pull. So, I mean, some guys get all hung up on fluorocarbon. I don't. I'm not. I'm not criticizing. Them. It's just I like a leader that I can tie a great uh, hard knot with. And a certain length, a minimum length. I use three feet. Okay. One arm. One arm length. And I tie my bucktail direct to it. And are you tying that bucktail with like a with a loop knot that allows that bucktail to have a little bit more action, or is it you would rather have strength of knot and forego a loop knot? I mean, I had a tie loop knot, Gary. You know how to tie one? Uh, yeah, I do know how to tie yeah, one. Yeah. It must be a Wilmington thing. I never learned how to tie one down up here. No, I tie straight. I, mean, I keep it really simple. I tie a bimini to a Yucatan to a clinch knot. A bimini is simple. You're joking yeah. me about a loop knot, and then you're like dropping like you tie a bimini uh, knot. Seriously, I don't know how to tie a loop knot, man. When I commercial fish King Mackerel, they used to tell me to tie a perfection loop. I don't know how to do that. I can't remember how to. I mean, it's like four knots that I know how to tie. That's all I tie. Excellent. Then I would keep doing that. I mean, I certainly would not do anything different. I mean, you're. Um, what do we is have? That why, is that where we go wrong when you fish with me? Is I don't have a loop knot? No, nothing goes wrong. You're the best Cobia fisherman I've ever fished with. That's not true. You're blowing smoke up my <laughs> fish with some really good ones. I know that. <laughs> I'm telling Eric Beats and you said that. Wait, you calling me a liar? No, oh, Gary. I heard you make up something a little while ago. But, oh, you're not a liar. <laughs> fair. That's, That's fair. fair. I did. Yeah. I, I made that up about Emmett. That's... Maybe. We don't know. We got to fact check it. It might I, be true. I wonder, again, like the way I approach this podcast, I mean, I, I do believe people are going to call you and want to go fishing with you. But the way we approach this podcast is like trying to give people the they best to- chance. To go they out. need to call. I've lost. I lost every trip in May except one. Thirty trips canceled in May. We're not talking about it. <laughs> no, clearly we're not talking about it. Thank you for not talking about it. But if this person wanted to go out themselves and try to catch a cobia, even if they did it once and then said, "Forget it," I'm going to call Donnie Davis. But I'm going to try it one day. Anything else to help them find the fish, man? You know, like, you know, I know you have to get used to spotting them. And everything you told us about the temperature change and about close in and about, you know, water depth. But I, I just, before I move on from that, because, you know, without finding any fish, you know, tie, you know, talking about a knot means nothing unless we find a fish for an opportunity. Any other advice you can give my guy? Now, these, some people are going to be watching this and they're going to be fishing off of Crystal Coast or, you know, out of Wrightsville Beach. Anything in general, like, you know, the old standard, hey, turtles are a good sign. Hey, bait pot. I mean, anything that would help out? Yeah. Um, things that I look for, like I said, I'm looking for the sharks, the rays, obviously bait, man. If you see bait on the surface, fish there. Because if the fish aren't there, then at some point they're probably going to end up there. But if, if you got turtles, yeah, that's always a good spot. Because it's not that they, you know, they're feeding on each other, but they're, they're in that same body of water, that water temperature. For whatever reason, a certain water temperature holds different, holds the same amount, holds the same species. And start fishing there. And what I tell people, I see it all the time, man. People will call me on the phone and say, man, I'm not seeing any fish. It's, we're dying here. Instead of speeding up, picking up and running somewhere else, if somebody around you has seen some fish, there's some fish there. Slow down, man. Slow way down. Take your boat, pull the throttle all the way back. Get down there at two knots and just creep around really slow. You got to learn to be patient. The best thing I ever learned in this business as far as approaching these things, man, it was the learn to be patient. Really take your time. Just go around in the circle, make yourself, get you some landmarks, whether it's a mile from one direction to the other, and just keep going back and forth on that same area. If somebody has seen a handful of fish there, there's fish there. Stay in that same area. Those fish are not moving you know, some guy will say, well, I saw some fish here. Then somebody will five, six miles away said, yeah, I just saw some fish up here. Don't pick up and steam five or six miles. Your fish haven't moved that quick. 
they're in that same area feeding on that same bait that was there. They might have gone down. It might be laying on the bottom now, but they're going to come back up at some point. So just slow down and just make big circles in the same area over and over and over. Now, are, are you an advocate or do you practice any just blind casting? Like if you're not seeing fish, but you're seeing that school of bait, will you drop it through? Will you, do you employ that? Yeah, you're getting into something now that I, I don't talk about a whole lot. We don't see the bait balls or we don't catch the fish on the bait balls like they do south of Hatteras and even up in the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. You'll, we'll see big schools of bunker here. And it's very rare, for whatever reason, I don't know, to see a number of fish in them. But when we're seeing the migration, we'll see big schools of fish. I mean, pods of 10, 15, 20 fish at a time. And what you see on top, there's always fish underneath them. So I'll get guys on the boat. I don't want, I don't want everybody casting their bucktail at a pod of fish that's coming through. Because invariably, somebody's going to cast into the middle of that pod. And you know what's really defeating is when it's a pod of 10 and you don't get a single bite out of them. So I'll have one or two guys cast way out in front of those fish, but I'll have somebody else throw bucktails, just blind cast them off to the side somewhere and let them sink down to the bottom. Then if we hook those fish, then start working those fish from the bottom right back up, like you would a trout jig or something like that. And you'll get some, you'll hook multiples like that. And that's the, that's the one thing I think that makes guys that are fortunate enough to do it for a living and get to do it a lot is that, the difference between catching one or two fish and catching six or seven fish a day, that's what it is, man. It's hooking multiples. I mean, that you basically took, that was where I was going to go with this question, like saying, I know we're, you're often seeing more than one fish, so what's the approach, you know, is the approach, we sort of talked about the approach if you see a single fish, but if you see multiple fish. So just to make sure I heard you correctly, we see a, we see a pod, whether it's five or ten fish, somewhere in the between. You got one key angler who is the key angler, and he's the one who's going to, what, pick out his fish, pick out his fish in the front of the pod? Yeah, yeah, still still employ the same tactics, man. Cast past the fish in front of them, whatever. They're all going to be moving in the same direction that pod is. But and if, please don't let everybody cast into the middle of the school. And if I'm not Bad. the key angler, I'm I'm waiting to see what happens with the key angler cast, or I'm allowed to cast somewhere unrelated, you know, off I mean, what? I'm sorry, I didn't follow that. Like, am I waiting to see no. if there's a hookup and then I put it around the pod? Or am I able to, in your opinion, another angler able to put it around the pod just to make sure you're not in spooking distance? Yeah, I'll let one guy, I try to get, you know, whoever's turn it is, that, first, that guy that's on, on point right then, he'll make his first cast. I want the second guy to go ahead and cast too. We're going to try to hook a double initially out of that pod. Just I don't want the second guy to cast over top the first guy. People get excited. I mean, I don't do any deer hunting, but the guys tell me, you know, it's, it's synonymous to that, man, where guys get all excited and they shake the gun and miss a shot. It's the same thing here, man. I don't want guys casting over each other because they're excited. So one guy, take his time, make a good shot. Second guy, take, a time, take his time, make a shot off to the side of that first guy. We'll probably, if there's a pot of five or six, seven fish, man, they're going to be aggressive. Majority of the time, they're, they're aggressive and they're going to eat. So one's going to fire at one, one's going to fire at the other. Next guys, man, just throw out there and blind. Let it sink down, you know, because those fish are going to go down. After you hook one or two fish, those fish generally aren't going to stay on the surface, man. They're going to go down. Something's going on, and then work it back up. Then, and we'll hook we'll hook three, four fish sometimes doing that. And that's, I mean, that's the whole difference between coming in with a really, you know, a good day or a really, really big day. Um, and so earlier you talked about being interactive on the boat you know, you're wanting them to make the cast, you're wanting them to make the hook, and then you'll even let them do the gaff. So how do you coach, you know, again, this is a learning process for many people watching this video. What, how do you coach them in the gaff? Like you certainly don't just let them go back there with a big hook and, and hope for the best. Oh, I do. I do let them go back there and hope for the best. I just, I tell them it's your fish. You lose it. It's up to you. I mean, it's on you, man, not me. I've, I've gotten really bad here in the last few years of Gary letting people do everything because I, I like having my – I like video and every, everything now. Did you know that? Yes, did I did know that. that? <laughs> yeah, but seriously, I've gotten every, really bad. Of, I mean, as soon as we have a fish on, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I've got the camera in hand, and so I'd prefer if people gaff because I get a bet, lot better shot holding the camera. And wearing a GoPro on top of my head. If this is so, a fish you really wanted to get in the boat and you figured, you know what, I'm going to give a little bit of advice. I'm not just going to play with my drone. What would uh, that right. advice be? All right. 
don't gaff behind the line. Gaff in front of the line. Fish is, you got the fish off the starboard side. Fish is tails off the stern. I've got my boating gear, so the fish is planed up. Don't go behind the line. I want you to gaff in front of the line. All right. All right. That's why I do it. And that's it. And stick the fish in the stomach, not in the head. And okay. People are going to say, why? Why are you going to do that? I was, learned, I was taught to gaff a fish in the head. If you gaff, gaff a Kobe in the head, he's going to roll around like a shark, like he doesn't have a bone in his body, and he's going to roll off the gaff. Stick him in the stomach. Call him, come all in one motion into the boat. Okay. I mean, I follow that too. Um, Donnie, I'm, I'm sort of at a loss for questions here. Like, what You're is not it? at a loss for questions. Come on. <laughs> what is it that we need to talk about? What, what I have know. I not See, asked? Um, it's really not that hard. Let the cat out of the bag. It's, it's really not that hard. Um, if people can learn to see them in, you can catch your own. I mean, it's, it's probably the greatest thing we have on the on the Atlantic coast to catch since we don't have tarpons up here, sight, sight casting tarpons anyway. So for me, it's probably the coolest thing we can do inshore. But um, unless you're like the guy I had on the boat last year, I don't remember if I told you this, man. We had one of those big days last year, man, where the fish were there and you could set up on them, on pods of them. And this dude up top was, I was going, man, you got to see them. They're right there. You, you, how come you can't see them? And he finally said, Donnie, I'm colorblind. I can't see. I, can't, I don't see browns or reds. I said, Ugh. dude, get the, the tower. Get somebody else up here. It's not, other than if you're not colorblind, it's not that hard. And you're, uh, so you're fishing from a tower boat. What's my chances if I don't have a tower boat? Put a ladder on there. You can see good. Just strap a ladder on? <laughs> Just strap, strap the ladder on West Virginia Tower. <laughs> All right. That's pretty good. I can't see anything wrong with that advice. Man. Oh, that West Virginia solid. Tower, man. Donnie like Davis it. says. Donnie Davis oh, told me this. You see him. You see him. I can't believe y'all don't see him down there. Oh, I've seen him. I think, I think the walker strapped on top of the T-top was one of my favorites. Those guys went big, man. They got a tower. They, uh, they split the money into it now, man. They've got... They've got what it takes. I'm both happy and That's, disappointed. You for see, him. it's because of me getting on here saying this stuff to you that those guys don't fish with me anymore. They went out and bought their own boat, started with a started with a walker, and now have a full tower on their boat. I mean, they might be chartering. I think we're set to talk with them in a month. <laughs> <laughs> Please get on there and talk. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. I can't believe I had him on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see here. Conditions, spatial and temporal distribution tactics and techniques and tackle donnie i think we covered everything for my viewers what what else are you doing of course cubby fishing is by far your favorite you know you would do it self-described all year long if you could you know they're just not there all year long you know someone here just getting an introduction to donnie davis doa charters what else are you doing throughout the year when you're not chasing cubby um do whatever it takes gary i i'll go shark fishing like a lot of guys will man i mean people give them a hard time but man if you can downsize your tackle and catch those things they don't have scales they really pull hard and they jump a lot of fun we'll go jack fishing pull like a donkey kicks you know if you feel like tearing up your tackle come august i'm really start i move into the sound and start counts concentrating on speckled trout uh, i'm knowing everybody in the sound whole coast of north carolina does it but it's fun, man. I, I enjoy, for some reason, I enjoy catching small fish that pull like a wet sock in three feet of water. Um, yeah, I, I like that too. I mean, I don't quite describe it that way. <laughs> but I, I totally understand the analogy you just made. I was a very effective analogy. What do you mean analogy. you don't describe it that way? Why not? What are you going to do? Wax poetically on the speckled trout for me? <laughs> no, I was going to use a bunch of expletives when I described it. <laughs> that I you're, mock to... you're mocking me <laughs> am i <laughs> donnie davis <laughs> we are wrapping up i want to thank you for coming on talking cobia we're going to bring you back on later in the season perhaps to talk wet socks but right now this is the fisherman's post podcast series saying goodbye to you man i appreciate it gary i kicked my family out for this they were really unhappy they all wanted to see mr hurley i made him go downstairs but <laughs> You'll we'll pay for it, not me. We'll Skype later <laughs> and have a little family moment. All right, Gary. Thanks, Donnie. Thanks, Donnie. All right, man. See you, Billy. Bye-bye. Yeah, what a funny show. You guys, you can tell you've known each other for a while. Known each other for a while. There, 
I mean, I would start telling stories, but I believe his mic is still live and he can <laughs> retaliate. So I am just going to let it lie. Uh, Instead of opening uh, up that pan- Pandora's box, I'm just going to say, why, yes, Billy, I have known him an awfully long time. Well, dude, I learned an interesting fact today that almost 3 million people in the world should not go cobia fishing because that's how many colorblind people there are. <laughs> We just knocked out three million people from Copia Fish. <laughs> oh man, it sounds so much fun, dude. Now, do you guys do fly fish for those two? Is that a fly fishing fish? I was, um, I was gonna ask, but I didn't want to get any hate from two people. I just well, you would one. definitely get hate from one. I think you would get some <laughs> mockery from my friend Captain Donnie Davis. I would love actually to take you out there and have, show up at Donnie's boat in the morning when you carry rod. your fly rod. I, I would be a good time for me. I think Donnie would enjoy it too. Again, going to the mockery. Yeah, you can catch him on the fly. But if we're talking, if, if I, I can't speak for Donnie, but if I were to attempt, it would say the efficiency of spinning tackle far supersedes yeah. the fly approach to these fish. Sure. So that's what I would say. For people who don't know how to use a fly rod. That'd be exactly what well, I that would, would be say. an special treat for Donnie if you were to show up with a fly rod and say, I don't really know how to cast this, any pointers. Dude, that would be hilarious. I'm going to keep that in the back pocket. Maybe Donnie will forget this if we ever get a chance to go. <laughs> anyway, on to bigger and better things. Gary, good episode, man. I, I did learn a lot. It was good. I'm, I haven't been Cobia fishing, but I did learn a lot. So. Man, as I mentioned in that podcast, man, you know, again, uh, by virtue of Fisherman's Post, I get to go on a lot of great trips with a lot of great captains. Every year. I mean, I'm very fortunate in that capacity, very fortunate in that capacity. But right up there, you know, is the sight cast in Fracobia. You know, there's just something about going under the Oregon Inlet Bridge. I mean, I don't even know what it's called now, but, you know, going underneath the Oregon Inlet Bridge, going out the inlet, taking that right hand turn, and, you know, feeling very confident that you're going to have multiple shots. And it is like, in regards to Donnie, man, that he's got a tower boat where the tower is significant enough where you can put two people up there. So, you know, what I've especially liked about fishing with Donnie is, you know, not, and I spend plenty of time in the bow of the boat, you know, waiting for instruction, trying to help him spot, you know, or just see anything, identify anything. But what's great about fishing with him is getting up in the tower. There's room to be comfortable up in the tower. And then you really have a panoramic view and you feel like you can really try to contribute to covering the expanse of water in the hunt for something brown floating through the top of the water column. Perfect. Be the only time that you look for something brown floating in water that you get excited. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I'm thrown off. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I want to give our sponsors a real quick Marine Warehouse, just another shout out. Really appreciate those guys coming on. And they actually have two locations, one here in Wilmington, North Carolina, and then also one in Johns Island, South Carolina. So go to their website, marinewarehousecenter.com, uh, for more information about those guys. And so just wanted to give them a quick, uh, another little shout out. And also be sure to subscribe to our podcast on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, um, any place that you can find a podcast or listen to it and also watch it on IGTV. So yeah, Gary, that is it, man. That's all my promotion stuff that I had left over. All right, Bill. Thank you very much. Until next time. Fisherman's Eye.